Greetings, dear viewers. In this video, I'm going to talk about some aspects of uh, modern Irish history which are often overlooked. Um, looking back to the 18th century, when we were a kingdom, a sister kingdom of Great Britain, and our monarch lived in Great Britain, even though he, sometimes she, was also king or queen of Ireland. So uh, Catholic subjects of the monarch often wrote loyal addresses uh, expressing their allegiance to the monarch in the most effusive and florid terms, and then asking for concessions, relaxation of discriminatory laws. Patently, this was not in the gift of the monarch. He or she could essay to direct policy by trying to persuade the Irish Parliament or the British Parliament to change the law. But he or she did not always get his or her way. The monarch did not have legislative power. He or she wielded executive power. The um, real might of the monarch was in patronage. It was the gift of the, in the gift of the monarch to appoint people, to promote and demote people. In the army, the Royal Navy, the established churches, some schools, universities, hospitals, the civil service, government ministers and so forth. Um, and so these um, gongs could be handed out to try and induce people to vote one way or the other. But again, the monarch did not always get what he or she wanted. That's what the 1688 revolution established. I advisedly avoid calling it the glorious revolution because that's the value of judgment. Looking on to the 1790s, the Act of Union was hotly debated. There were unionists and anti-unionists, they called them. The anti-unionists um, in the Irish Parliament were all Protestants because only people from the Protestant minority were allowed in there. Thinking they were the Irish nation, the Protestants were 25% of the population. And members of the Church of Ireland were more like 12% of the population. People in Parliament were almost exclusively from the Church of Ireland. There were a few Presbyterians and so on, but they had to recognise the supremacy of the Church of Ireland to be allowed in. Um, and uh, I can't recall which one of them it is saying, Duh, well, it'd be, I'd be like that Carthaginian and um, at the hour of my dissolution I should pledge uh, eternal hostility to the enemy and of my children do likewise. And these people often who'd fought tooth and nail against um, the uh, rising of 1798. That's the astonishing thing. And of course, when it came along, when the Act of Union was passed, the people in Parliament who'd, who'd vowed to fight it against it to the bitter end just shrugged their shoulders and learned to live with it. We often call it Grattan's Parliament, the Irish Parliament of the 19th century. Henry Grattan was only a prominent um, MP at the end. He and Henry Flood were two of the so-called patriots. And by patriots, I mean those who wanted a greater deal of um, self-government for Ireland. Because a lot of our legislation came under the Great Seal of England. Well, we could pass it, but we just required that to be put on it. So um, uh, there had been a declaratory act in 1720 over a case called Wood's Halfpence about a certain coin being struck in Ireland. I don't quite recall the intricacies of the legal rigmarole, but anyhow, the Parliament of Great Britain passed an act saying that they were entitled to legislate for Ireland. I'm not sure they ever did so. Um, there was another declaratory act in 1760 when the Parliament of Great Britain proclaimed that it was entitled to pass legislation for the 13 colonies. In the 1770s, the American Revolution broke out. France, the Netherlands and Spain soon declared war in the United Kingdom. So um, I'm not sure if any Irish troops went to fight against the revolution. There were some Irish Americans who were on the side of the revolution. But some people in Ireland thought, oh, well, these American revolutions got the right idea. Um, to some extent with independence, but also greater um, liberty in terms of freedom of expression and so on. We had a very wide degree of freedom of expression in Ireland, could have been wider I suppose, um, but maybe but electing things on a more rational basis. Um, and there was some chance to be invaded by France, Spain and all the Netherlands. So the British army did not have any soldiers in Ireland, but so they could all free to go, therefore uh, volunteers were set up. Um, the uh, uh, Irish volunteers Sorry, I should call them Volunteers of Ireland rather than Irish Volunteers at that stage. And these were ordinary men who were not paid and had to buy their uniform and musket and would be parading, prepared to repel any enemy who came along. They were fencibles, as in short for defensible, only to serve in Ireland. Um, but then they had a political aspect and they wanted free trade with Great Britain because there were tariffs on our exports to Great Britain and some of them would... Uh, parade past the Irish Parliament with a sign saying free trade or else, hinting they might um, try and break the connection with Great Britain if we did, they didn't get what we wanted to. 
But the radicalism of the Irish, or sorry, the volunteers of Ireland could be exaggerated um, in as much as um, they, um, they, they pass various resolutions that the only people who could rule Ireland were the king, lords and commons of Ireland, who were definitely monarchist. And they even believed in hereditary government, that the House of Lords was a hereditary chamber in the Irish Parliament on Stephen's Green. It's, it's a bank now, that uh, building. Uh, so in that sense, extraordinarily conservative. So when um, Irish Volunteers were founded again in 1914, it was a very, very different organisation. Um, sorry, 1913, I should say, at the Rotunda in Dublin that November. Uh, right, so then the union was proposed. The uh, British Prime Minister was William Pitt the Younger. He wanted it brought in, but he thought then there should be Catholic emancipation. There should be equality for the Catholic majority and the Protestant minority. Catholic bishops supported this, again, something which is overlooked, and the Orange Lodges opposed it. Now, the Orange Order was a very small organisation at the time. And don't be thinking that the Orange Order was always pro-establishment. It was briefly banned in the 1820s. Another point is there were often several different organisations with the word Orange in the name. So the uh, lineage of the Orange Order is unclear. That's why it's disputed exactly where and when it was founded. The Orange Order of today is very different from the organisation that originally existed. Not only was it anti-unionist, it was only for County Armagh to begin with, it was only, it was only for Ulster, then it was only for Ireland, that's for the whole world. And um, what else? It was only for communicants of the Church of Ireland initially. So uh, Daniel O'Connell, well, he didn't want the Act of Union to be passed. And for the first few years after the Union, there were people who, who, would, like to, who would like to change it back. And Shelley came to Ireland and wrote his address to the Irish uh, people. Um, saying, I sympathise with you, you shouldn't have united with Great Britain. Um, we had our own separate currency for a few years, which somewhat uh, goes against the Euro, saying, oh, well, we must have the Euro because we're in the European Union. Well, we're in a full parliamentary union with Great Britain and had a separate currency for about the first 20 years. And then, curiously, even after we left the United Kingdom, we continued to use the sterling till the 70s, as in pound sterling was legal tender in, in the Irish state. I know we printed our Irish pound, the punt, however, um, it was simply, it simply looked different. It was exactly the same value as the pound sterling, and our interest rate was set by the Bank of England. We simply followed that. In, economically, we were more or less an adjunct of our neighbour. It's only in 1973 that we, that we went that way. 1998, we agreed to join the euro, but that change didn't kick in to New Year's Day 2002. So we had a very brief experiment with uh, fiscal independence. Um, anyway, Daniel O'Connell proposed the cause of Catholic emancipation in the 1820s, which is an entirely worthy cause, that uh, the majority of us should not, not be discriminated against by law. But he wanted this change, there no more reform. He had his Catholic rent, a penny from every household. He wanted it to be a mass movement, which is why he kept membership very low. It wasn't actually rent, it was a membership fee, but they called it Catholic rent. As we all know, he got his way in April 1829, when the Duke of Wellington, an Irishman, withdrew his opposition. I won't go into that too much. But um, O'Connell said, you grant me this concession and that's it and I'll never bother you again. I don't want any more reforms. But no sooner had he pocketed that one uh, than he wanted um, the repeal of the Act of Union to go back to being a sister kingdom as we had been in the 18th century. However, there would be one crucial difference and that is the Catholic majority would obviously have the right to vote in BMPs. Well, we had had the right to vote from 1793. Um, and... Uh, so the Catholic majority would be in the saddle. Um, anyway, it was the loyal National Repeal Association, as he had for a long time. One of their slogans was repeal and no separation. They still wanted the monarch, and they still didn't want to completely separate from Great Britain. Um, bear in mind, until the 1870s, MPs from Ireland were almost all either Whigs or Tories. Some Whigs were pro-repeal, others anti-repealers. Some Tories pro-repeal, others anti-repealers. And then um, there were just um, his uh, repealers who were not Tories or Whigs, but simply repealers. He didn't get anywhere. That's another one of the fascinating things is um, th there was no Nationalist Party for most of the 19th century. I've looked it up and for the 100 years of the 19th century, there was a Nationalist Party for only 48 of those years. Now, it went by different names, whether it was the, sometimes the Repeal um, Association or the Irish Home Government Association, or the Home Rule Party. It changed its name, but it's broadly the same movement. Then Isaac Butt came along, and he founded uh, the um, Home Government Association, later called the Home Rule Party. He formerly had been a Tory MP and thought we, were, we prospered through the union, but they looked at the famine and said, well, we can't argue that that made us rich. 
But even he said that we, um, he um, had favoured a Siamese union between us and Great Britain, like Siamese twins joined at the hip. You can't, we can't be separated. It would kill us to separate up ourselves from them. And he said um, that um, since Henry II, Ireland's been a dependency on England. So he completely accepted that we needed to be connected to our neighbour. That's another fascinating and oft overlooked point. Our connection with England goes back much further than Scotland's political connection with England. Uh, so why is it that um, there was such a separatist sentiment in Ireland whereas there wasn't in Wales and Scotland? I suppose it's partly just that, that 20 miles of sea, but less actually, Antrim to Argyll, but maybe...